I, I guess I would say that good networks are self-optimizing. If you look at it mathematically, people that are wrong tend to cancel each other Absolutely, out. Absolutely, yeah. You use that wrong long enough, you're going to select yourself right out of the process. So Darwin is a little. But what about, so for instance, New York Times had this article on the gentleman, he was a reporter in Columbus, Ohio, and when they were, uh, Um, when they were they were considering the rule adoption on the SEC regulation that allowed the securitization of mortgages, so the, the CDOs, he wrote a four-page memo and said, and he predicted all of the systemic risk in that whole whole world. And so, but the network said of lawyers, of bankers, of you know. So there were 999 opinions that said, go do this. This is a great thing to securitize uh, these mortgages. And there was one cognitive outlier that said, this could be a disaster if the market's going in the other direction. The New York Times had printed the whole memorandum. It's just fascinating. So how, in, in your model, how do you find that one person? How's that work? By running, you could take uh, one market and, and, and I could give you a lot of reasons why you should believe what that market's, you know, that it's accurate. But you're not, until you run it for several cycles and say, wow, here's a guy that's been right consistently, it's, it's sort of like just taking the snapshot and say, hey, here's what the sort of general consensus is. Um, but you won't have that level of confidence that you can really trust in what it's saying unless you're running it, you know, a long period of time enough to say, all right, well, he's been right, you know, this much. And so I wouldn't say that that you should just automatically, you know, hey, our first prediction that market that we're going to run is, you know, a market on, you know, merging, you know, Siemens and GE and what our market cap's going to be in, in three years. I mean, that's a huge problem. Um, you know, let's run something on a smaller subset and then basically prove it out, and then we can tackle larger things. There was a question up front a minute ago. Somebody in the back? Is there a yes. time period kind of or a size of community before you get the sense that it's representative of what you're looking for? So that you're even getting community norms and values being established? I don't know about you guys would be interested in it. We have zero sort of uh, representative samples in our markets. I won't say zero. You look at any market that we run, it skews probably six different ways at least. You know, um, uh, as far as gender, income, you know, geography, because people are self-selecting, you don't have to have a, a, a sample because there's there's um, people that that want to do well. You know, you can have a market that's skewed in all these different directions. Um, even like a good example is the a typical telephone. You know, Gallup poll is, is a, supposed to be a representative sample of the population. Um, predi prediction markets skew heavily male, upper income. Northeast, you know, a couple of different, you know, education way higher than average, and yet they get it more right than the polls, which just are very, you know, as much of a representative sample as you can get, because there's a huge incentive, you know, to be right. You wouldn't bet unless you thought you were right, uh, and so we don't spend a lot of time, you know, on trying to sample exactly what the population is. We just put it out there to, to the population and let the ones who know come tell us. So, uh, David, I have a question for you. So, following up on Michael's point about how it was important to have a champion within the company. Uh, so, at Best Buy, how high up was your champion uh, for this initiative? So, that would be the first question. Yep. And then, uh, also, you talked about incentives and disincentives. Right. So, I heard about the incentives, right. but if you could also speak to the disincentives. Right, absolutely. So, Jeff Sieverts, who's the EVP uh, in, in the marketing, um, was the one who called us and says, hey, I want to do this. Um, after we ran a, an initial sort of first phase uh, of a few months, and then they were very pleased with that, and then they wanted to run it. Now it's running you know, in perpetuity, and so he takes that and goes to the CEO and other VPs. Um, so it's got a, a lot of uh, executive support, but it started at the sort of VP executive VP level, and that's typically. I mean, you want to go as high as possible. I mean, uh, that's one of our. our our sort of success criteria is, hey, who's the executive that's really going to push this, who's going to put people on it, that can interface with us, and, and really market it and expand it. Um, so 
As far as disincentives, I mean, there's a couple things uh, that you can do there. One is the fact that you don't, if you make the incentives good enough in terms of desirable enough, the fact that you aren't getting them should be a disincentive. Um, another thing would be um, in the source of uh, social, they've got a, a social network called Blue Shirt Nation and Best Buy. So by doing well in the prediction market, you can in increase your profile. As I said, we haven't seen people get fired for doing poorly in the prediction market. Um, so the, the disincentive is that, as, as Tim talked about, you consistently get it wrong over time, then you're just basically reducing your influence in the market. And, and if you've got enough of an influence that you should be in the market, then the fact that you can't play is, is shown to be effective enough. I like the we talked on the phone, and there was one case where the guy's secretary was just cleaning yeah. his clock. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, what, how do you feel when you take your paycheck home? Yeah. You know, and your secretary just killed it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a question. In, in general social networks, so not in the predictive model, but in the comments that you get within a social environment, can those themselves become predictive as to how the group will um, behave, and how would they be different if the social network is based on an experience versus a personal characteristic? We all live in New York versus, I don't know, we all went skydiving. Um, and how would those really affect the type of, perhaps, commentary and predictions or, you know, that, that they would have, and how do you harness those to make decisions within your firm? Yeah. Uh, it's my point of view that our market, our industry is relatively immature when it comes to uh, answering that question. Uh, about as, as deep, I guess, as it goes today is that you can measure the attributes which you described. And there are better tools but basically that's true. Part of that, by the way, is a technology issue because early stage reporting and, and measurement is running against production environments, not, not bad, but data. Uh, that will change. It is changing very rapidly. Uh, big investments are being made in semantic search and in uh, tools that are sentiment analysis and are, can pull from a body of comments the experience characteristics, the trending, the you know, demographic, the GR, but not just attributes, the individual. So I think in another year or two, or maybe even three, you'll see a much better uh, kind of product, if you will, or a much better, you know, a, a much better capability. But I don't think that's not, it's at least not prevalent today. Some of the best work's been done actually in the military uh, and in the Department of Defense and stuff like that. But even that is not, for at least what I've seen, it's not. Just for me, 